Good morning, everybody. We're live here from the birdhouse, and today we're talking about hummingbirds and how you can attract them to your backyards using different feeders. And um, we've got a couple different types of feeders, nectars, plants. So as always, we love to know who is on. We are in the height of migration season right now. We've got all kinds of birds that are flowing in. So if you've had any neat sightings, absolutely put those in the comments. People are starting to get Orioles more often in their backyards that they still are coming in uh, kind of slowly, but we're every day getting more and more reports of Orioles in people's yards and a couple hummingbird sightings as well. So they're coming in slowly, but this week we should have more and more sightings. So if you have any neat sightings, absolutely put those in the comments. And if you have questions, you can put those in there as well. Um, today we'll also be joined by the owner of the Sweet Seed Company, which you guys are pretty familiar with, the Hummingbird Nectars. Um, the Sweet Nectar Company will be joined by Josh Stasek. So he'll be joining our broadcast after the presentation. So stick around because there will also be a giveaway, which everyone loves a good giveaway. So let's get started talking about hummingbirds. So here in the East Coast in, in New York, we only have one species of hummingbird. So if you go out West, there's going to be all kinds of different types. But here we just have the one species, and that's called the ruby-throated hummingbird. And the male has that ruby colored patch on his throat. That's how they get their name. And then the females and the juveniles are going to be more plain. So they are the same species. So if you see a hummingbird that just isn't as colorful, it's probably just the female, especially this time of the year. As you go later on in the season and you see one that's a little more dull, it could be a juvenile. But right now, as they're first migrating in, they've got their new plumage. And um, so they're going to be in their breeding plumage. So the males are going to be more brightly colored with that ruby patch on their throat. And here is their range. So you can see their non-breeding range is down in Mexico and Central America. And we are in their breeding range. So they will make the trip all the way from down south up to our area and even a little bit further north into Canada. And one of the most amazing things about hummingbirds, I think, is that a lot of them will make that trek right across the Gulf of Mexico on one flight. So it can be an over 24 hour flight, but they will they will do it all in in one push. There's nowhere to really stop. So um, it's pretty amazing that a bird so small can do that kind of migration. But that is the ruby throated hummingbird. There, um, there are, there have been uh, rumors, I guess you could say in the past about hummingbirds going on the backs of other birds in order to make their migration happen, like jumping on the backs of ducks and geese. But that is not the case. They will make that trek all on their own, which is pretty amazing. So where do you find hummingbirds? They can be found in a diverse type, types of habitat. They're found in old fields, forest edges, meadows, orchards, stream borders, and backyards. In their wintering grounds, they live in dry forests and citrus groves and hedgerows and scrubs. So they have quite a, a few different places you can find them in. And uh, forest edges and old fields, not too dissimilar from backyards, so they can be quite common in backyards. The past few years, people have been reporting not as many hummingbirds as is normal. So if you have been unsuccessful in the past attracting hummingbirds, you're not alone. Um, people have been, been a little bit more able to attract Orioles recently than the hummingbirds. So if that's the case with you, you're not alone. But there's several different things you can do to attract them to your backyard, which might help. So ruby-throated hummingbirds feed on lots of tubular flowers, as well as hummingbird feeders, and sometimes even the sap from trees. They also eat some insects, so they're known to spiders right off their spider webs. They'll eat little fruit flies, so they do eat insects as well. And I love this picture here of the hummingbird. It's hard to tell if it's going after the bee or after the flower, uh, but they are 
insect eaters, and they're able to drink from these long tubular flowers because they have a really, really long tongue. So if you look at your hummingbird feeder, sometimes it's hard to tell how they can get in there so well because their beaks are long, but sometimes it looks like they can't quite fit in there. Well, not only are their beaks long, but their tongues are also really long. So here's a picture here of a hummingbird that's got its tongue sticking out there. So they can reach into feeders really well and also really long tubular plants. Here's another picture there of a hummingbird tongue. So some pretty cool photos. As far as nests go and nesting, the females will build their nests often on a slender descending tree branch. So they do like something pretty specific. The nest is the size of a large thimble and it's built directly on top of a branch rather than in a fork. The nest is made of thistle or dandelion down and held together with strands of spider silk. So they're quite delicate. And there's no such thing as a hummingbird house. We get calls a lot and questions about attracting hummingbirds with a hummingbird house. So there's no such thing as a hummingbird house, but we do have hummingbird nesting platforms, which are a newish thing for us. So we haven't gotten that much feedback about these yet. So I'm curious if you've tried one of these, if it's worked. It's um, you attach it to you know, a tree or the side of a house, and there, it's got two little spokes, and in the center is a divot where the hummingbird is supposed to build its nest. And then um, in, the, in the back of it, it's got some little nesting material, some really natural fine cotton that they can use to build their nests. So uh, word is out about how well these work. So if you've used one, I'd be curious to know what you thought about it. So no such thing as a hummingbird house because they will just do it all themselves and build their nest on a tree branch. And as far as their clutch size goes, they'll lay anywhere between one and three eggs. Usually it's two and they'll have anywhere between one to two broods a year. And their eggs are quite small. They're only about half an inch long. So their eggs are very, very tiny. Once those, uh, once those eggs are laid, the female will sit on the, the nest and that incubation time is about two weeks. So it's anywhere between 12 and 14 days. And then those eggs hatch and the nestlings will be in that nest for about three weeks, anywhere between 18 to 22 days. And then they're off into the world. So that is your, your hummingbird nest right there. And as they grow, the hummingbird babies will expand that nest. So they start growing quite large and they start expanding the nest because it doesn't quite fit them very well. If you are into hummingbird gardening, you might see some lookalikes that appear to be hummingbirds, but they are not. This is the hummingbird clearwing moth. It's often mistaken for hummingbirds because first of all, it's a day flying moth. So it is active during the day, not during the night. And it hovers just like a hummingbird does. It's got the same kind of body type. So they're known to feed on the same types of plants as hummingbirds. So if you see one of these, if you see something in your garden that looks kind of like a hummingbird, but a little bit off, it's probably one of these hummingbird clear wing moths. So we've gotten uh, quite a few people who've reported getting those in their backyards. Uh, probably not right now, but as we get into the summer months, they're going to be more common. And plants. If you do any kind of hummingbird gardening, I'd love to know what kind of things you've had success with. If you put those in the comments, that's always great. So here are some hummingbird plants that we recommend to attract hummingbirds. Some of them will also attract some butterflies and they will attract that hummingbird moth as well. Trumpet honeysuckle is a vine, and that's a really good one for hummingbirds. It's got these really long tubular kind of coral colored flowers. There's another type of um, vine that's good for hummingbirds called trumpet creeper, and that's going to be much larger. So it's got much, much larger blooms, but it can also get kind of unruly. So if you've ever had trumpet creeper in your backyard or um, if you've ever seen it anywhere, it can get quite, quite large and it can overtake things pretty easily. So just keep that in mind if you do plant for um, hummingbirds. If you're looking for a vine and you have kind of limited space, I would go with the trumpet honeysuckle. It doesn't overtake things like this trumpet creeper does. So um, that can get quite unruly, especially in your backyard garden. Cardinal flower is what the hummingbirds seem to like the best in my yard. That is what I've had the best success with. It seems like I 
that's in bloom, the hummingbirds will go right to the cardinal flower every time. So this is one I've had great success with. It's a native, just like those other trumpet vines, and the hummingbirds absolutely love it. Bee balm is another one, and I see the hummingbird moths on, on bee balm all the time, so they really like that too. Um, bee balm is pretty easy to grow. It spreads pretty easily, and the, uh, the hummingbirds absolutely love it. It's got a nice smell, and it has these really bright colored red blooms. Sometimes it's purple, depending on what kind you get. And columbine is an, is an early bloomer, which is wonderful for the hummingbirds. When they're first coming in now, they tend to come to feeders, it seems, more often than they do plants, just because there's not as many plants in bloom right now. Uh, and so columbine is a nice early blooming plant that can help attract them. Same with coral bells. Um, coral bells have little kind of delicate flowers that the hummingbirds will feed from. And flocks. You can't go wrong with flocks. This is a good one for humming, hummingbirds as well as butterflies. It comes in many different colors and types. And so that one you can easily find in garden stores. And as far as attracting them to your backyard, there's different things you can try. One of them is hummingbird swings, which is kind of a goofy concept, but they do seem to work. Hummingbirds are very territorial. So the idea with the hummingbird swing is you hang this around where your feeder is so the hummingbird can perch on the swing and oversee their territory and then if they see another hummingbird or another bird coming in towards that feeder they kind of chase them away so it's just a fun way to give the hummingbird a perch that they can oversee their territory and where you can see them too so really kind of a goofy concept but they work we have so many people who've uh, surprisingly had success with these and then there's many different types of hummingbird feeders so uh, my recommendation when you're looking for a hummingbird feeder is getting one that's easy to clean uh, because you do want to change the nectar out often because it can get moldy over time. So you want one that is easy to clean, easy to fill. Uh, we carry a lot of hummingbird feeders by this company here on the left. This is called a Humzinger feeder and that's by the Aspects company. It has a lifetime warranty on it. So that's one that I've traditionally used year over year with really good success. Um, this other one here is kind of the more traditional style, I guess you could say, of hummingbird feeder. This is called the Dr. JB's feeder and that one is, is a really good seller for us as well. And you can also get window bird feeder, window hummingbird feeders, just like you can put seed feeders on your windows. There's also hummingbird feeders for windows. And here's one here called the Jewel Box. Suction cups right onto your window. And it has a built-in what's called an ant moat. So we've talked about those in the past. It's a water barrier that will separate the feeder from ants. So ants can't get across the water to get to the feeder. So that I recommend that one if you're looking for a window feeder for hummingbirds. This is called the Jewel Box, and that works really, really well to attract hummingbirds, but also keep the ants out. There's also feeders right, uh, right in your hand that you can feed hummingbirds in the palm of your hand. These work really well out west, again, where there's a whole bunch of different species in there. Um, they're raiding feeders like crazy, especially during migration time. That being said, we've had customers that have had really good success with these working, especially if you have hummingbirds coming pretty, pretty often at the same time. They tend to come to feeders around the same time every day. So if you've got them coming with some regularity and you take your feeders down and you go out there with these types of hummingbird feeders and you put sunglasses on so they can't see your eye movement, these can work to attract them right to the palm of your hand. So something a little bit different, uh, but they can work, but it takes a little bit of patience. And then I like this one. This is called the humbug. So this is something totally different. It's not a nectar feeder at all. The idea behind the humbug feeder is you put banana peels inside of this and those banana peels will attract the little fruit flies and hummingbirds eat the fruit flies. So with those hummingbird peels, you'll get the fruit flies laying their eggs. More and more fruit flies will appear and the hummingbirds are attracted to this feeder because it is red. So they are attracted to that color and they'll pick off the little fruit flies from the feeder. So I tend to use this one later on in the season um, after the hummingbirds, they seem to stop coming to my nectar feeder after a little bit of time for some reason in my backyard. And then I'll switch it up with this humbug feeder and they just pick those little bugs off. So it's really fun to watch. And everybody needs accessories, of course, for their bird feeders, ant moats. Uh, you probably want an ant moat for your, your hummingbird feeder 
and this is to keep it from getting covered by ants basically. So it's just a little cup, you fill it with water and then you hang your feet. The ants can't get down and across that moat of water to continue going down to your feeder. So they're super simple, but they work. So perfect way to keep ants out of your feeder. And then there's cleaning brushes. You wanna make sure you clean your feeders often so they don't get moldy. If you've got any kind of black stuff that's starting to form around your feeding ports, absolutely wanna bring that feeder in and clean it up um, just so it doesn't get moldy or there's, there's nothing in there that can harm the hummingbirds. And nectar, there's different types of nectar that you can get. We've got some concentrates you just add water to. We have some ready to use stuff, which is what I like. I just um, will grab this and pour it into the feeder. It's super simple, um, but there's lots of different things that you can, you can get as far as nectar wise to put in your hummingbird feeder. You wanna stay away from dyes, so you don't wanna put any kind of food coloring in it. And if you're finding that it's hard to get out to the feeder often to continually fill it and keep it fresh, you can add this product, what's called Feeder Fresh Nectar Defender to your nectar. You add just a little bit of that. And instead of having to change your nectar out every you know, three days or so, you can change it out about every week or every 10 days. So that will just keep your, feed, your, your, your nectar fresh for longer. So especially if you're going away, that's a perfect Thing that you can just add to your feeder and just one little bottle depending on how many feeders you have uh, but one bottle should keep you going all season long so i tend to just need to buy one bottle every year so it's just a little small bottle um, but it works so it'll keep your nectar fresh longer so if you have any questions absolutely put those in the, the comments we're anxiously awaiting more reports of hummingbirds and usually they start to roll in more this week although we've gotten some reports you know, that's it's really this week where they start to trickle in. Same with Orioles. Some people were getting them trickling in last week. And um, this week, they're, we're getting more and more reports. So every day, there's more and more flowing into the area. So if you've got questions or comments, absolutely, you can put those in the comments. And we are going to be joined now by Josh Stasek, who is an expert in hummingbird nectar and all things hummingbirds. So if you have questions you can have for Josh, you can throw those in the comments. Uh, but good morning, Josh. How's it going? It's great. I love it. We um, actually did have, I put my hummingbird feeders out last week and we had Orioles. So um, I know they make specific Oriole feeders and Oriole nectar as we do, mm -hmm. um, but we were all excited um to get the oreo bright orange always awesome to see it and you can't believe how orange they actually are until you see one again so yes. um it's been good how about with you everything good very good and where, so uh where are you broadcasting from that you've gotten your oreo uh so i am in marcellus just uh to the east of auburn so very close to rochester um in, in the Northeast anyway. So we were, um, my mom is Onondaga Hill area. If you know the area, there's a community college there and she usually gets them before I do. I live in a little village called Marcellus and we're down in the valley. And I've noticed that the Orioles hit the high plains and don't really go in the valleys. I, I've also seen that with hummingbirds during migration as well. So. Um, I think they try to stay high and out of trouble. <laughs> they need to eat. So that's right. That's right. So that's why we like. That's another reason why we like this uh, your your product so much. The Sweet Nectar. It's a local company that you guys started right here in upstate New York. Is that right? Yeah, and we thank you. Uh, the Birdhouse has been a great dealer of ours for many years now, and um, we do. We manufactured it in Syracuse for the longest time, and then we moved to Auburn. Uh, we still do a lot of our pilot batches locally. However, um, the demand has spiked, so we call in some Copac help every now and again, and they've been making it right to our formula. Um, they adhere to our batch records. So if we can't do it, we uh, have great partners that can. And um, once again, it's all hot packed. We don't put any preservatives in it. Dye free, of course. 
Um, we have found that the clear dye free product is great. People feel good about using it. Um, we do not use sodium benzoate or potassium sorbate. You see a lot of that in some of the other commercially made nectars. Um, we use a little bit of citric acid, which brings the pH below 4.6. And just like when you're canning grandma's tomatoes, or she always did, um, we, you don't really need to put anything in there if you hot pack it because you're keeping that pH below 4.6. So we use the citric acid um, and it's a natural product to keep our uh, pH low. And we found that it actually, um, the, the Nectar Defender is a great product too, but with ours, we can go about a week. I like to change the sweet nectar every week. I go out every Sunday and change my feeders around and um, it's been great. So uh, we have seen it lasts just a tad bit longer in the hot summer. Okay, so that's the citric acid there, keeps it fresh longer? Yes, yeah, yeah, and no, you'll see. That's good to know. Yeah, you'll see on the back of the ingredients list, we use um, our nectar is infused. We have three types of nectar. Uh, and talking about the Orioles, we offer an Oriole nectar. Um, we offer a butterfly nectar. And the uh, original product is our hummingbird nectar. And so with our hummingbird nectar, we started out, we use steam distilled wildflower hydrosols in it because there's been a lot of studies that show hummingbirds have a sense of taste and smell. How is a turkey vultures know how to circle over roadkill? I don't know. People say they have a sense of smell and they can tell when there's a decaying animal somewhere as gross as that is. Um, but hummingbirds will, uh, they, they're attracted to high sugar content and also the floral essences of different flowers have been uh, preferential in doing a lot of different studies we've done through our time as a company. We found that they prefer certain flowers and we use those hydrocells in our nectar. Um, we also put a little bit of salt, um, Gatorade calls it electrolytes to help prevent dehydration and a little bit of calcium to help promote healthy egg development in the females. So we're fortifying our product. If you look at the ingredient list, um, these are not preservatives, but fortifiers to help with the product. Very similar to what the hummingbirds would find with natural floral nectars. Um, so many people get all excited about putting sugar water in their feeders, which is great, which is how you do it, sugar and water. Um, but when you compare just a sugar solution to what they would find, they being the hummingbirds in nature, um, they get a lot of minerals that come up from the soil into that nectar to include salts and calcium. Um, so we tried to uh, replicate those natural nectars the best we could. And that makes sense, too, because it seems like we get so many reports from people early on in the season that hummingbirds are coming to their feeders a lot. And then once more and more flowers are in bloom, they're tending to go to those nectar producing flowers. So that, that kind of makes sense if they like those hydrosols that are in the flowers. Right. Coming to those. So that makes sense why they would like this nectar so much. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, we do, as mentioned, we do the uh, Oriole nectar as well, which we've used in our hummingbird feeder. I know they make Oreo feeders for whatever reason. We have an Oreo feeder side by side with the I think we do have a best one, which I know you sell there. Um, we do have humzingers as well. And the Orioles, for whatever reason, they, they do love that hummingbird feeder. However, we fill it with our Oriole nectar. And our Oriole nectar is different that instead of the wildflower hydrosols, we use steam distilled citrus um, mm. hydros, uh, extracts in our Oriole nectar. Uh, more attracted helps with the Orioles who like those orange slices and the orange halves. Um, and then we did talk about later in the season, I know you sell butterfly feeders there too. Yeah. I've, I've never seen a hummingbird moth at any of my Oriole or butterfly feeders. So it'd be great. I often wondered why we don't get those, those hummingbird, hummingbird clear wing moths at a feeder. 
Um, but we do make butterfly nectar where we use a combination of both the wildflower and citrus hydrosols. Um, so we uh, looking at some of the comments here, I do see that someone had asked about, do you mix it with water or does it go in straight? And I do know that we have two different products. We have a concentrate and there's a little pictogram here that says this pouch makes three times what's in this. So you mix one part of this with uh, two parts of tap water. I use just tap water. My tap water is pretty, um, pretty clean. And then we also have the ready to use. I know both of them are sold at the birdhouse here, the concentrate versus the ready to use. So um, that's a great question, Lynn. We do, um, we offer both. And oftentimes it's funny. Uh, my wife makes fun of me for putting it this way, but you have lazy shoppers and you have the cheap skates. She reminds me that I should use convenient shoppers and economically minded. Um, but we had offered just the concentrate for years because we thought no one's going to pay a lot of money for just sugar water they can make at home. But we found that three out of four people prefer to purchase ready to use over the concentrate because it's easy. You know, all of us get all hopped up. Hummingbirds are coming. We get busy. We go to camp. We have sporting events we go to. And so then it's just easier to pour the nectar right in when you're standing out there at the hummingbird feeder. So we see that a lot of the customers prefer the ready to use. That's, and I am one of those people, <laughs> the convenience um, shopper. You're a lazy bum, huh? I'm a lazy bum, that's right. Um, <laughs> Things happen. So, right, and I am too, you know. <laughs> it is, um, I do, I have found that early in the season, hummingbirds prefer a bit of a higher sugar content and some of the things you read online or some of the documentation will say instead of doing a four to one mix with sugar water try a three to one until the hummingbirds um, have some natural flowers to feed on i have found it allows us with the concentrate to actually go 50-50 and it's bringing that sugar content up to about 35%. And then the same, is the concentrate the same as the ready to use where it'll last more like a week instead of just a um, yes. yeah, Oh, definitely. good, okay. Yep. And then is your Oriole nectar as sweet as the, the hummingbird nectar? Like when we look at recipes, sometimes the Oriole nectar is not as sweet, but the Orioles will kind of yeah, you want to be about 18 to 20% on the Oreo nectar. Um, our, of course, with the concentrate, we put instructions to mix it with um, five parts water to one part on the concentrate nectar. Our ready to use nectar is 18%, whereas our um, hummingbird nectar is 22, 21, 22. Um, is our limit on that. So we try to get a, a great sugar content. Now, a lot of the other commercial nectars you'll see in the ingredient list as invert they list. We use pure cane sugar. We don't use any high fructose corn syrup. We actually take bags of sugar and we put it in hot water and we cook it to about 200 degrees. Basically, we're using pasteurization as our preservation method and we're making that invert sugar, which is going in this pouch. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other liquid nectar companies, if you go to any of the big box stores, you'll see 20% as invert, which is really only 80% to begin with. So that sugar contents down into the 14, 16 range on that ready to use and some of the cranberry juice cocktail plastic jugs. Um, so gotcha what it, about the uh, butterfly nectar how does that rank do they tend to like things that are sweeter or yeah so we we keep that sugar concentration as the same as the hummingbird so that's that 21 22. um we have found that there's hummingbird feeders i have personally um, we have some great fiber clay bird baths we got through your place and um, 
one of the things I've done for butterflies is you put the bird bath out and you put a bunch of stones in it or gravel, and then you pour the nectar over that and the butterflies will land on that. And we've found, we've had great success with that. Oh, okay. Yeah. We've talked about that in the past of doing that with like salts and sand and that kind of thing to make a puddler. I never thought about putting the nectar in there that that could work also. Yeah. And we've seen, I actually got, I was at a butterfly house um, and saw, got that idea that I guess that's what they do when you go to butterfly houses, they'll put out a big bird bath with stone in it and they pour the neck, the sugar water and the nectar over the top of the stones. Gotcha. Okay. I'll have to try that this year. Um, as far as the nectar goes, once you open it, should it be refrigerated? We get that question all the time. Um, we do, um, we make the wine bottles of the ready to use. I know you had a picture of those. Um, those should be refrigerated after opening them. When you use the ready to use with the easy pour spout, no oxygen is going into that. So the bag doesn't burp and, and intake any oxygen. You could leave these in a garden shed and not have to um, refrigerate it. However, if you have the room, we recommend it. But these are the only ones that don't. You know, the easy pour spout's another good point. You talked about ant moats. And last year I had a wasp and hornet problem. You know, yeah. early on, I had a feeder and I poured some nectar in and it went on the outside of the feeder. Now this attracts ants, this attracts wasps, hornets, and those hornets were chasing the, the hummingbirds away, actually. And so another benefit of this bag is this easy pour spout. You can one-handedly hold your bottle or your feeder underneath it and with the other hand pour the nectar in it and it, you don't have to use a funnel. You don't have to spill it all over the outside of the hummingbird feeder. And so we've found that that helps prevent that wasp and hornet problem too. Yeah, that's a good point. We've um, we've got these things that are called um, wasp scarers. They're, they look like almost like a lantern, like a paper lantern, and they mimic a bald-faced hornet's nest. And Got you can it. hang those kind of by your feeders. And people have had pretty good luck, surprisingly, with those helping deter some wasps and hornets and that kind of thing. Um, I didn't have it in the presentation, but that's a good point because we get that. That's a huge issue for people later, especially later in the season when there's more and more out of that uh, out there. I've heard um, I was fortunate to meet Dr. JB several years ago. And he had mentioned that years ago, we would always use the skin so soft when you go hiking. Have you heard that to prevent um, wasps and mosquitoes? And so it was a product I think made, was it Avon or someone? He said, if you take some petroleum jelly and mix some of that and you dab it on with a Q-tip underneath the feeders, um, that will keep the wasps and hornets away from the feeder. Just straight petroleum jelly. With, mixed with the skin so soft. Oh, mis mixed with the skin so soft. Gotcha. Yeah. So, okay. I wonder. Uh, that's it. I've never done it, but I will try this year if I have that wasp and hornet problem. Yeah. Interesting. It's weird the things that'll work to scare them away. <laughs> yes, I know. Sometimes um, I run out there and try to scare them, but then they just sting me. So that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Backfires. So right. your your product, um, it's called Sweet Nectar, but you you uh, started with a, the company called Sweet Seed. You guys started off by doing seed mixes, right? Like how did you change over to, to doing nectar? So we, um, we did start with making custom blended seed. You could go on our website and you could make, um, uh, you could pick a seed base, black oil, millet, milo, and then you could put in different things like mulberries, blueberries, cherries, et cetera. And we would give, uh, you could name it. And, you know, if I were to give you a gift, I would say Liz's lucky bird seed, and we'd put a special tag on it. And we did all right. And we sold some bird seed that way, just mail order. But then here in central New York for both months of summer, we needed something to do. And we decided that was a joke because we probably get more than two months of summer. But we decided we needed to get into the 
hummingbird nectar product. And so that's where we started. Our first product was that hummingbird nectar concentrate in the wine bottle. And we wanted to make something better. And that's always, you know, one of the things we want to do is make products that are just like what birds would find in nature. So we started researching like mad, how do we make a hummingbird nectar that's just like the nectar they would get from flowers in nature. And we did our best to replicate that. Um, and that just took off to the point where we were selling 99% of our sweet nectar versus our sweet seed. So we have gotten out of the bird seed and um, concentrated on just hummingbird nectar, oreo nectar, butterfly nectar. And we do um, seem to think that we're probably the only company um, in the world that makes just nectars for wildlife. Um, in fact, we do have a patent and trade dress that we're the only liquid wildlife feed that can be sold in a wine bottle. Um, Ooh, so we have a patent on that. Someone calls up Liz and says, hey, do you carry the wine bottle hummingbird nectar? You know, of course, that's sweet nectar. Oh, yeah, people love it as a Mother's Day gift, too. It's like a cute way to like pair it with a feeder of some sort for Mother's Day. That's always right. For this yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great for people who, you know, in my later years, I've decided to, you know, drink more mocktails and less of the hard stuff. And there's some people who have like converted to a healthy lifestyle. So everyone brings a bottle of wine to a house or a dinner party. Um, we found that it's a great alternative um, than bringing a bottle of wine. You bring a bottle of hummingbird nectar. <laughs> there you, <know>. you go. <laughs> there's a good gift. As far as um, backyard birding go, do you have any uh, favorite favorite birds that you see in your backyard? We've been seeing a lot of the rose-breasted grosbeaks this week. Ooh, okay. And so I've um, had a really good time um, uh, with that. In fact, the female is um, very, you know, if you, if you, you have to double take because it looks like a large sparrow or something, mm -hmm. right? or a large um, house finch or purple finch. And so we were able to get, a, just this morning we had, a female at our feeders. Last week we saw the male um, with the rose breast, of course, very easily identifiable. Um, but then we saw the female. Yep, like this uh, morning was there as well. So um, those are neat. We've had indigo buntings um, and it's just been a, a good week. Um, I have not um, seen a lot of the warblers coming through, um, but I keep looking. Yep. <laughs> what do you no. use? Um, do you have binoculars that you like? Um, I, and I think you sell these, of course, but some of my favorite, I just leave them right here because a bird will come to the feeder and I'm looking, you know, I'll be having a conversation with my kid or wife and then I'm looking at the feeders. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love the, the Nikon, um, I use the uh, Monarchs are my favorite, I think, yeah. you know, for the um, price and for the quality, I think it's a great product. Um, and if, you know, you dump it on the ground, it's got the nice rubberized coating, so it shouldn't <laughs> break. But you're not going to feel real bad compared to some some of the higher priced optics, right? They're they're very good for the, but you pay a lot, and so I think the price versus quality. I also take a little set. I like my Monarch eight by thirties. I usually leave oh, these in yeah. my glove box. Yep, um, yep, those are good. I, they're great, or you travel. You know, I was fortunate mm -hmm. enough to take the kids down to the Florida Keys a couple weeks ago. We saw the magnificent frigate birds. I've never actually oh. seen those. We noticed that that was what they were, but we hit the migration right, I think. Um, but I had these little teeny, I put them in my backpack. The um, the 8 by 30s I think, are a great little travel set, too. Once I again, if you bang yeah. them up, beat them up, I got 
you know, sunblock, you know, coming from up north, you know, us northerners need to slather sunblock all over our face. Otherwise, we turn into a potato chip. But I got sunblock all over it. And I, I really don't mind because um, they're, you know, you pay a good buck for them. But at the same time, they're meant to be used in the field, right? Yeah, that's I've got those too. I love those. They're the best. Yeah. Um, let's see. Some people have their sightings here that they've. So, like when we do this broadcast, we always ask people what they're seeing. Sometimes people will have something neat or different, or just kind of clues us in on what we should be looking for. Um, Randy here says he's had white crowned sparrow for the first time today, purple finch, chipping sparrow, and a cowbird still making daily visits. I saw a lot of cowbirds out yesterday. Actually, they're they're out and about. Um, still waiting for a hummingbird and oriole to visit. White throated, I've seen. I love white throated. Uh, yeah, Karen looks like has some white throated sparrows and a pair of Carolina wrens. They have been singing quite a bit uh, out there. Margaret says she just got her first Oriole this AM. Yeah, we've uh, heard from a few people already this morning, um, just in the store and calling who got their first Oriole uh, today. So I'm still waiting on, on my first Oriole though. Um, uh, Randy says it's all about convenience and I agree as far as using the ready to use nectar. I, I have to agree with him. And it's a, let's see, Ed who uh, often signs on and sends photos in says the, the hummingbirds that visit our feeders also visit our fuchsia plants all the time. So far, no hummers at our house, but we did have a female Oriole just this morning. Also, we have a pair of Carolina wrens raising five chicks in a flower basket at the front door. <laughs> Yeah, we get that all the time. Carolina runs our nesting in interesting places, which is really fun. Um, so here's talking about butterflies and attracting butterflies. Vicki says, we just visited the uh, butterfly world in Florida. They uh, There they had trays of sliced bananas on a tray that served as a butterfly buffet. Yeah, a lot of butterfly feeders will have little spikes on them for the, the bananas or fruit, and then they have a spot for nectar on them as well. And Lynn has a tip that she's used peppermint oil to keep the bugs away. I, somebody else told us that once too. I've got to try that this year. I've never tried that before. Yeah. And I think one of the things they talk about is mixing that with petroleum jelly because the petroleum jelly you can put on the bottom, you know, on the bottom of the feeder mm -hmm. and that's your base. You mix that up with the peppermint oil, I would say. And um, you just kind of swipe it on with a Q-tip underneath the feeder. I'm going to try that. I'm going to add that to my shopping list. <laughs> <All right. laughs> it's worth it. I mean, it's worth a shot. Yeah. Um, I know it'll help keep like sometimes mice and stuff away too. Um, There's going to be a run on peppermint oil, just like there is with grape jelly every spring, right? Exactly. Yeah. Go go out and buy now before, before it's too late. Yeah. Every year at Wegmans, um, as soon as Orioles hit, like, all the grape jelly is gone. <laughs> it happens every year. Um, Randy says, I will make a purchase of your nectar, Josh. I believe in supporting the mom and pop businesses. We, we appreciate that, Randy. And I do know, I don't know if we should tell him about this, Liz, but if Randy's, like, one of the first 12 people to mention this down at your shop, we've decided to um, do a little promo of yeah. the nectar pouches so yeah we will be doing a giveaway so josh and his company was nice enough to donate some nectar pouches of the ready to use uh to us so the first 12 people who come into the store and mention that they saw this broadcast in the giveaway will get an absolutely free pack of the sweet nectar so thank you for for donating those randy's got his tennis shoes on already i, <laughs> I think he just came in the door <laughs> So uh, but we do appreciate it, Randy. And it is, you know, we are proud of the product we made. Um, it's crazy to say when people, they ask me what I do. And um, I tell them I have a company that makes hummingbird nectar. Uh, they laugh a little bit until they know that I'm serious. And so <laughs> it's been a fun ride. We've met a lot of great people and we travel the country um, selling our hummingbird nectar. And um, we appreciate the customers and people 
knowing that we put our heart and souls into this as a lot of us business owners do. And um, uh, we really thank you and appreciate that. And your nectar, it's good for, it's not just like the hummingbird and oriole species we have here. Like people are out watching. We get some people watching from all over the place. If they're out on the West coast or what have you, um, they can, they can purchase it just, just fine for their species that they have. Yeah. And it's, you know, hummingbirds are strictly in America's based, you know, down through South America into Canada um species we've had people as far as australia there's like honey creeper birds mm -hmm. i believe and and actually there's some in uh hawaii as well whereas you don't have the hummingbirds in hawaii um so we've had people use our nectar for um lorikeets in the past and so um it we've we've gotten some um, great feedback from worldwide. However, primarily through America, uh, West Coast, um, Portland, Seattle, hummingbirds are pretty much there uh, year round. So even as far north as Seattle, I think they have some uh, year round uh, hummingbird residents. Oh, interesting. Oh, neat. Yeah, I would. I didn't think about how you could use it for different uh different birds entirely that would drink nectar, but that makes sense. Yeah, and there's really, um, there's a lot of people will use hummingbird feeders for different types of birds. We've heard lorikeets, I think. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Vicky saying, please post the name of Josh's product here. I'd like to promote to my friends. So it's the, do you, do you go by sweet, sweet nectar or sweet? Uh, if you type sweet nectar, that usually um, will get it there. And um, there's definitely a very similar, uh, you know, not as good, of course, um, bird specific stores um, throughout the country. So if you have friends in, say, California, mm -hmm. a lot of garden centers on our website, you have to type sweet dash um, seed you can go through and get a dealer finder if you're out of the state or somewhere else, mm -hmm. uh, of course. Gotcha. So. You've got a, um, a location finder? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Well, it looks like that's everybody's comments and questions for the day. Uh, I want to thank you for, for joining us and kind of teaching us a little bit more about nectar and some of the differences between yours and just using regular sugar and water. So that's that's been great. I've got to go out and uh, refill mine with my ready to use today. <laughs> so that's wonderful. So we're going to be back on Saturday with another broadcast and we'll keep you guys updated about what kind of birds are coming into the area. As always, you can send us your photos and send us your sightings and we will see you on Saturday. So have a great day, everybody. And thank you, Josh, again for joining us today. Thank you. Bye-bye.